Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our NITEX webinar. And today we have Dr. Simon Tetwa, who is a senior lecturer at the University of KwaZulu Natal, also known as UKZN, where he also did his undergraduate and postgraduate studies. And his, his research focuses on point set and point free topology. And he currently supervises postgraduate students in this field. And Dr. Mteto's research is largely funded by the NRF, uh, the DSI NRF under the Center of Excellence MS, the UCDP and his own institution. And he's currently a member of the South African National Committee for the International Mathematical Union from 2020 till today. And he is a director at Mtetomethics NPC, which is a movement that seeks to educate the general public about mathematics and its associated careers. And for today's webinar, you'll be giving us um, a, a brief um, look into a closer look at Friedenthal and rim compactness. So you are here to listen to Dr. Mteta, not me. So Dr. Mteta, whenever you are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tutugile. Uh, as Tutugile already mentioned, my name is Simo Mteta from the University of Wazulu Natal. Uh, that's where I'm delivering this webinar from. Uh, I've had uh, quite a number of people asking me uh, when am I going to be in Stellenbosch. Actually, in the corridor here earlier on this morning, someone said, did you miss your flight to Stellenbosch? And I told them, no, uh, the webinar is, uh, is going to be online. So again, thanks to the NITEX for inviting me to do uh, this, really appreciate it. So a lot of people have wrote from, from NITEX, so I don't know exactly who am I supposed to communicate with, uh, uh, but one person said at some point after I agreed to give a talk, said to me that I must make one third of my talk accessible to almost everybody, even even in a, to a man walking down the street. I'm not sure how to do that, but I'm going to try my level best to adhere to that instruction. So yeah, as the title already suggests, today I'm going to talk about student talk, and I'll touch on what we call rim perfectness as well. Yeah, so who is uh, Frudenthal? Uh, Frudenthal is, is a German-born mathematician. I'm going to give you a history about him just now. And then after that, I'll talk about his compactification that he defined for topological spaces. And then after that, I'm going to move to the Frudenthal compactification of frames then touch on rim compactness and what I call zero-dimensionally embeddedness of sub-objects of frames or locales. And then I'm going to speak about the food and power compactification as a least upper bound of some class of compactifications. And then we're going to talk about reflections, uh, whether that means reflections on the talk or reflections in a mathematical sense, in a categorical sense, I don't know. We will find that out when we get there. So who is Frudenthal? Frudenthal, as I already mentioned, he is, uh, or was, because he's late, uh, a mathematician who was born in Germany, although identifying as Jewish. Uh, he was born in 1905 and passed away in, in 1990 a year before the man that is giving this talk was born. There's a nice quote by Rudenthal that I like the most. There are several quotes by him, but I like this one that says that no mathematical idea is ever published the way it was uh, originally found. And 
and I can relate to that because uh, usually when we define things in mathematics, we take time to think about our definition and then we change the definition. So by the time one decides to write a manuscript or a paper, uh, whatever they discovered originally would have slightly or even drastically changed. But also, even if your idea, your original idea was sent uh, to, I mean, for publication to a journal, and there is there's some percentage that the reviewer would tell you to change things. So in that sense, again, no mathematical idea is ever published the way it was discovered. I, 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 can, I can agree with that. Rudenthal uh, contributed a lot to the community and the society at large, community of, I mean, mathematical community and the society, society at large. I'm just gonna list a few things here. He discovered this journal that is called Educational Studies in Mathematics. He discovered this journal, uh, I think in 1968. Uh, this is the journal that publishes mathematical education. So mathematics education papers, not papers really focused on mathematics, but rather how mathematics is taught. And this is a Springer journal. It was published by Springer. So it's a, it's a very, very reputable journal. And he is known for what we call realistic mathematics education, where he believed that uh, students or learners should observe things by themselves and try to mathematize them and then get taught formally later. But first observe and try to mathematize whatever phenomena that you can observe by your eyes. And then after you did that, then your instructor will come and formalize uh, things along those lines. So this was opposite to what was called then the new math, which was a, a way of teaching mathematics uh, in an abstract sense from the very early stages. And uh, Prudenthal, as you, as you can see, realistic mathematics and abstract mathematics are sort of sitting on the opposite ends. So Prudenthal believed that mathematics should be observed first by the learners or the students, they try to formalize things themselves. And then an instructor comes and, 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 and clean that up. But then the new math was known to just dish things like analysis, abstract algebra, at a very, very early stage, uh, as early as grade school, so primary school uh, in, in, in a South African system. Yeah, that, by the way, new math was very, very criticized. It lived for about 20 years and then it was shut down because uh, people believed it was not effective. Rudenthal is also known uh, for this uh, constructed language here that he called Linkos. Linkos is a constructed language uh, introduced by Rudenthal but it was not really put to use for a long, long period of time until some astronomer from, uh, I believe, Canada uh, saw that this, this language actually might be used to, uh, for some, uh, maybe of use uh, to astronomy. I don't know what he did with it, but it just said there in the book that Prudenthal wrote for a long time and then in the late 90s, 1997, that's when this astronomer from Canada started to observe that this actually is a useful thing. And for mathematicians, he founded that journal, Geometre Dedicata. That is a journal that publishes uh, top research in geometry. So if you are a geometer, you probably know this uh, this journal right here. Specifically, mathematics now 
Rudenthal is known for a couple of things, including what is known as the spectral theorem, uh, especially for people who deal with free spaces and functional analysis. And also there is a theorem that is called suspension theorem, for sure people from algebraic topology, specifically homotopy theory, they will know what that theorem states. And the magic square, people who work with Lie algebras, they will definitely know what that is. But today I want to talk about the Frodenthal convertification. So topologists, specifically point set topologists, they know Frodenthal for the Frodenthal compactification. So before I define that precisely, let's go through some uh, basic nomenclature. Remember that a topology on a space X is just a collection of subsets with the property that the empty set and the entire X is in this collection. And if you give me two things in this collection, their intersection is also in the collection. And the arbitrary union of things in this collection is also in this collection. And this collection here, members of this collection are called open sets. Now, you would say that a set is closed if its complement is an open set. We, if the set is not closed, you can define what you call the closer, the closure of that set, which is just the smallest set, smallest closed set containing that particular set. So if you want to define the smallest closed set containing A, you just take all the intersection of uh, the closed sets containing A. That is very easy. And you would say that A is dense in X if the closure is, is X. That's a reminder here that a topological space is called separable if it has a countable uh, uh, dense subset. A compactification would be a compact topological space containing the space X in a dense way. If it doesn't contain X, at least it contains a copy of X. By compact, remember, I mean that if you can cover this thing by open sets, then you can finitize that cover. Now, to Frulenthal. In, 1990, in 1951, actually, Frudenthal defined this compactification that we call the Frudenthal compactification today. He defined a compactification of X for a separable space, which was metric, by the way. And this space had this property that its remainder is a zero dimensional space. In other words, this thing over here has got a basis of open sets. In 1952, Kitty Morita said, we don't need to actually have the separability here. We can just define this compactification for the so-called rim compact spaces. Remember, a space is rim compact if it has a basis of open sets with compact boundaries. So, he defined it in a way that he, he just from this basis he collect all these comp I mean these open set with compact boundaries puts them in one thing and she defines a, a uniform structure on the space using these uh, these sets and then the completion of that uniform space becomes the fluid enter. in other words uh, this the remainder of X in this thing over here will be a zero dimensional space. Now, I forgot to mention here that Frudenthal used another idea to define his compactification, the idea of ends. And this is a idea of, basically you take a nested sequence of compact sets and then you define um, what you call ends using such an aspect sequence of compact set. Now, in 62, Skilarenko constructed FX using a different method, using the method of proximities. I guess here he was relying on the fact that 
for a completely regular space X, uh, uh, proximities are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with compactification. I guess here, his thing was each proximity corresponds to a fluidental compactification. And he's, in his paper, he actually found such a proximity. And he showed that the remainder of X in this compactification is actually uh, zero dimensional. Furthermore, he proved that this compactification is an example of what he called perfect compactifications. In a book that many topologists like Uniform Spaces by Isbell, this idea of defining a Freudental compactification using proximity was actually um, appreciated in one of the chapters in that book. Incidentally, Isbell wrote a nice paper uh, titled Some Properties of Compactification. He wrote it with Hendrickson. That was a nice paper. At least for me, it was nice because I could read it. Most of the time, it's not an easy exercise for me to read Isbell's papers, but that one, I found it to be nice and it's very, very easy to follow for me. So I guess because there was an extra hand, namely Hendrickson. Henriksen, by the way, did some work uh, in Frudenthal, or rather defining Frudenthal using algebraic methods, because so far, these all these methods are besides, I mean, the topological methods. So before I go to that now, uh, that is looking at Frudenthal compactification in an algebraic way, let me just have some definitions. Remember that we denote by Cx the ring of continuous functions from x to the reals, and C star x is just consists of the bounded things in x. Now, we also define C hash of x to be uh, a subset of C of x containing these functions satisfying this property over here using maximal ideals of Cx. And Cf of x is defined to be just a subset, again, of Cx containing all the functions that assume uh, only a finite number of values outside some compact set. That's how, that's how we think about that one. And we say that a subset of C star x or of Cx generates a compactification, why? If for every element that you take in S, for every continuous function that is in X, you can find an extension, a continuous extension of that function there. And this set here, the set of all these extensions, they separate points in Y. By that, I mean even two, x and y not equal, you get that f alpha of x is not equal to f alpha of y. There is another related concept of a subset determining uh, a compactification, which is, is precisely the same definition, except you want the points to be separated in y minus x in the remainder. OK. So in 1977 now, Hendrickson showed that if you start off with an, a real compact space and this set C hash generates some compactification of X, it will follow that X is real, I mean, is real compact and whatever compactification that was generated is the Frudenthal compactification. Remember by real compact, I mean, you can think of this as saying that X can be viewed as a closed subset of the Cartesian power, even when, when that Cartesian power is given the product topology. So that was Hendrickson thing. And another author by the name of Unlu proved that this set here, the set of all the function that assume finitely many values outside some compact set, uh, will always generate the Frudenthal compactification, but if X is locally compact, locally compact and housed. 
A locally compact household space, by the way, is always really compact. So you can speak about the prudential compactification of that. Now, in the 2000s, early 2000s, Domingos showed that this set, the same set, generates a compactification if and only if X has a base of open set whose frontiers have compact neighborhoods. So the frontiers are contained in some compact set. And in this case, the generated compactification is precisely a prudent term. So now, this was in the early 2000s, going to 2011, an author by the name of Daman and Babula decided that it, it was a good idea to define the prudential compactification of frames now. And uh, he did that in that paper there. And he further studied its local connectedness in this paper that I mentioned there. And by the way, in 2021, the guy called SM, uh, who actually did some, some, some nice mathematics and contributed in the direction of Prudental. Specifically, this guy showed that this compactification, not only is it perfect, but it is minimal with respect to perfectness. So it is the smallest perfect compactification of a ring compact frame. And recently, the same guy gave the Frudenthal compactification as a project to his PhD student by the name of Gugule Tunokwebela. And the things that I'm going to mention here are from Gugule Tunokwebela's contribution as well. Now, let's remind ourselves what is a frame? A frame is just complete lattice with that infinite distributive law being satisfied. And the top element of a frame, I'll just write one for that. And the bottom element, uh, I'll write zero for it. Top and bottom, they exist because I said this thing is complete. A frame homomorphism is just a map between frame M and L such that it preserves finite means and arbitrary joins. So, in particular, it will preserve the top and the bottom element. Every frame homomorphism has got a right adjoint, a function moving in the opposite direction, satisfying that property right there. Now, the Frudenthal compactification is only defined for what we call ring compact frames. So we have to define what ring compact frames are which means we should start to talking about regularity. But before we do that, maybe it's a good idea to give examples of frames. Uh, if you give me a topological space, I can give you a frame out of that, namely the set of all open sets of that topological space that becomes a frame. But not every frame arises this way. Uh, for example, a complete Boolean algebra is a frame, but if you take a specific complete Boolean algebra where you don't have atoms, then that will be a, a frame that does not arise this way. It is not spatial, does not arise from a space. Another example that does not arise from a space, example of a frame, is that of radical ideals of a commutative ring. Remember, an ideal, you would say it is radical if it is equal to the radical of itself. So the radical of an ideal is just the set of all the elements in the ideal such that A to the N belongs to the ideal for some N. So if, uh, the, and if that generates the entire ideal, you'll say that the ideal is radical. Uh, that collection is also uh, gives rise to a frame. One can also mention here close ideals uh, of a unital sister algebra, but I think these examples are enough to convince whoever believes that frames do not exist. Now, when do we say an element A is rather below another element B? We say that if there exists another element C that separates them in this fashion. So they exist 
an element C that meets A at the bottom, and then it joins B, the other element, at the top. And you would say that uh, a frame is regular if it is joint generated by uh, uh, things that are right up below. So for each A, each A is joint generated by things that are right up below itself. And a pseudo complement is just the joint of everything that misses A in L. You would say that your frame is compact if whenever you can write one as a joint of some subset S, then you know that one is already a join of some finite subset of S. Let me remind you here that a frame homomorphism is dense if the only thing being mapped to zero is zero. Now, what is a compactification? A compactification is simply just a compact regular frame M and a dense onto frame homomorphism to L. So that's what you would call a compactification of a frame. Banashevsky showed that compactifications of a frame are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with what he called strong inclusions. This would be an analogous result for frames. Uh, there, is an, uh, there is a result by Smynov, who was the supervisor of Skidarenko, by the way. Smynov showed that for a completely regular space X, uh, proximities are in a one-to-one -one corresponding correspondence with the compactification of that space. So this is a way of looking at proximity proximities in the point free context. So a strong inclusion is just a binary relation satisfying all these uh, properties that I, I listed here. So if you have A is strong included in B and A is greater than X, B less than Y, you have that. And most importantly is number four there, that interpolation property. It is always useful, especially when dealing with compactness. So Banashevsky's correspondence, actually one can outline it. It goes this way. If you give me a strong inclusion, I can give you a compactification like that. So this is a joint map going from the set of all ideals, which are regular with respect to this strong inclusion. Conversely, if you give me a compactification, I can give you a strong inclusion defined like that. And these function, these maps are inverses of each other. And that's how we get the isomorphism uh, between the partially ordered set of compactification and the partially ordered set of all strong inclusions. True story. So now the Frudenthal compactification, this was defined by Babular now for a rim compact frame. A rim compact frame is a frame that has a basis B uh, such that the frontier of everything in B is compact. So that's the way of saying that. If you like, you can say the up of this element here is always compact. By the way, this up of this element is always a frame. As Serene would like, it's going to be a sub locale, but I'm looking at it here as a frame, compact as a frame. Now, the Prudenthal compactification is precisely the compactification that corresponds to this strong inclusion right here. Remember, there is a one to one correspondence between strong inclusions and uh, compactification. So the Frudenthal compactification, or what Babular called the Frudenthal compactification, is precisely the compactification that corresponds to the strong inclusion defined here. By the way, let me draw your attention to this BL. This BL is actually a basis. If you start off with a rim compact frame L, this BL becomes a basis. In other words, every element in L can be written as a joint of things in BL. True story. So now the question is, why did he call this the Frudenthal compactification? Remember the Frudenthal compactification in spaces, it was such that it has got a zero dimensional remainder. So the remainder of X 
in Fx was a zero dimensional space. Is this true in this case here? And the answer is yes. But before we go to that, maybe we have to be clear about what we mean by a remainder in frame. So let's go to what Serene likes. A sublocal of a frame L is just a subset satisfying these two properties. The heighting of elements, if you take an element in, a, in S and an element X in L, that height belongs in S. And this subset is closed under arbitrary means. By the heighting, I mean that uh, uh, if I say A height B, I mean this element here that satisfies this condition. Now, it is good to note that the lattice of all sublocals, one can actually order sublocals by inclusion, and the lattice of all sublocals uh, forms what we call a core frame. Uh, in other words, the, we just dualize the, the frame law. The bottom element of this lattice over here is the sublocal that contains only one, the top element. And the top element of this lattice is the entire L. L is the sublocal of itself. Meets are calculated as just intersections and joins are calculated using that formula right there. By the way, this lattice here is not generally, in general, it is not complemented. So if you give me an element in this lattice, you should not expect a complement of this element to exist. Sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. So in general, uh, this is not a, compl a complemented lattice. So we have a substitute then for what, what you would call complements. We have the notion of a supplement of a sublocal. And the supplement is nothing but the intersection of all sublocals joining S at L. And there's this formula here on the left that was uh, found by Isbell. He said, well, this thing here is the same as that. So it's the same as the join of everything that meets uh, S at the bottom. And we usually denote it by L minus S. This is not a set theoretic complement. It's just the notation. Bad one, if you might. OK, so the remainder then of a compactification uh, I mean, of a, of a frame in its compactification is defined this way. Remember, if you have a frame homomorphism, you will have a right eye joint going the opposite direction. Now, if you consider the image of the right eye joint, that is going to be the sublocal of M. Remember, the right eye joint goes from L to M. So that image function there uh, will, give, will give you a sublocal of M. And we define the remainder to be the supplement of that image thing there. Why? Because one can note that this image thing is actually isomorphic to L as sublocals. I mean, this is a sublocal, so it is a local. If you consider L as a local, they will be isomorphic. You can have a locally map a one to one, one to two between these two things. So that's what we call a remainder. And you would say that, that the compactification is perfect if it's right adjoined, there should be a star there. If it's right adjoined, preserve disjoint binary joints. Now, Babula then said, well, if you consider the remainder, take L rim compact, look at its Rudenthal, take the remainder, he showed that this becomes a zero dimensional frame. But his method was using congruences, I must confess. Uh, it was not using sublocals. But it's not a problem because there is a one to one correspondence between congruences and sublocals anyway. And uh, Ferreria, Picardo, and Pinto actually proved that you can 
pre proved Babula's theorem, but now using Sabloka. So this was reproven by Picardo and the team. And Babula observed that this is a perfect compactification. Remember, I mentioned earlier on that Ilaremko observed that not only is the remainder zero dimensional, but uh, uh, Prudental is a perfect compactification in spaces, and Babula proved that for frames as well. Now, let's define a further concept here. By a zero dimensionally embedded sublocal, I mean a sublocal S such that in L, one has a basis satisfying this theorem. So L has a basis such that this, I mean, this equation is actually true. In other words, you will have a basis uh, of elements here in L such that the frontiers miss S. You would then say that uh, that sublocal is zero dimensionally embedded if there is, is such a basis. By the way, if a sublocal is zero dimensionally embedded, it will always be zero dimensional in the sense that we know it that there exists a basis of complemented elements. The converse of this is not true. Actually, one can consider Roy's example and then take the stone check compactification, remove Roy from its stone check. That thing over there would be an example of a zero dimensional thing that is not zero dimensionally embedded. There are other examples, but that is a nice one because it, it talks about compact things. By the way, if you look at this definition, then you would quickly realize that every sublocal of a zero dimensional frame is zero dimensionally embedded. So if you start off with a zero dimensional frame, well, you will have a basis of complemented things, and that same basis will give you uh, a base that satisfies this condition over here. Now, what Nokwebela and SM did was to show that uh, this thing here is not just zero dimensional. It is in fact zero dimensionally embedded in that. So it's a stronger, it's a stronger condition being satisfied by this thing. And most importantly, if you start off with a rim compact frame L, that rim compact frame L, we know that it has the fluidental compactification and the remainder of L in, its fluid, uh, in the fluidental compactification is zero dimensional. We know that. But the converse is also true for rim compact frame. So start with a rim compact frame. Well, you will have a frame, I mean, a compactification such that this thing is zero dimensionally embedded, as we've shown here in the first bullet. And if there exists a compactification such that the remainder is zero dimensionally embedded in that compactification, that necessarily implies that L is a rim compact frame. So rim compact frames are precisely the frames having a compactification with a zero dimensionally embedded remainder. Now, I sort of mentioned in passing that we can order compactifications, somehow compactifications of a frame. And this is the partial order that we define on uh, the, the, the set of all compactifications. So if you give me two compactification, you will say that uh, this one is smaller than this if you have a function from the smaller one to the bigger one, a continuous, I mean, in, 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 in spaces that would be a continuous function, but we're talking frames here. So this would be a, a frame homomorphism satisfying this property here that this H for a smaller compactification factors through that thing there. And of course, you would say they're equivalent if this G is actually a frame isomorphism. Now, what I observe is that with respect to this ordering here, FL 
is minimal uh, with respect to perfectness. So if you give me uh, a, a rim compact frame and a perfect compactification of that rim compact frame, then that perfect compactification will be bigger than FL. So Prudenthal is the smallest perfect guy for a rim compact frame. True story. Now, I mentioned in the introduction that we, we're going to realize Prudenthal as a, uh, a, a, a least upper bound of some class of compactification. So maybe they, let me be more specific now. Uh, Banashevsky defined uh, what, what he called the smallest compactification, and he backed it up. Smallest compactification only exists for these type of frames, the continuous regular frame. A continuous frame is just a frame such that every element is joint generated by things that are way below it. By way below, I mean precisely that condition over there. Then Banashevsky said, well, I can define a strong inclusion like this. And this strong inclusion is the smallest strong inclusion on L. So if you give me another strong inclusion, this one will be contained in it. And therefore, it will induce the smallest uh, compactification, like what he called the least compactification. And as I said, the least compactification only exists for uh, continuous regular frames. And that can be found in that paper by BB. Now, before I go to the next theorem, let me just recall some nomenclature here. Local connectedness and connectedness. You would say that an element C is connected if you cannot decompose it into a joint of two things, two disjoint things. So if you can write C as A join B, where A and B are disjoint, then that necessarily means one of these elements is the bottom element. And you'd say L is connected if the top element is connected. It is locally connected if it has a basis of connected element. A connected component of an element A is just the maximal connected element less than or equals to A. Now, here's a nice theorem. If you take a non-compact frame which is connected, locally connected, regular, continuous, it has to be regular, continuous, because I want to talk about the smallest uh, compactification here. To say that the Frudenthal compactification is identical to the least compactification, at least from the frame theory's perspective, is the same as saying, or is equivalent to say that every uh, compactification has a connected uh, a connected remainder. Those are two equivalent conditions. And a slightly complicated condition is that if you take K in L, whose up is compact, then that K has exactly one component with this property here. So it has one component such that up C star is not compact. And again, this is a treat by Nogavella and that guy, SN. Now, let's order things. Again, I mentioned that Prudenthal is the least upper bound of some class of compactifications. And these, this class of compactifications are what Babulal called the N star compactifications of a frame. Let's remind ourselves what is an N star. It's just you take a collection of disjoint elements such that the up of the join of all of them is compact. But as soon as you delete one from that join, you get a non-compact thing. That is what Babo will call an N star. I guess uh, taking an idea from McGill. Now, if you take an N star, this is just a notation here. I write N 
u alpha where alpha is an n star and u is an element in alpha to be just the set of everything in x such that if you join it with this join here, you delete u from the join and then you get a compact thing. That's what I call n uh, u alpha. Set of everything in x such that take the up, you join x with the rest of the things when you when you subtract u, you get a compact thing. That's what I call n u alpha. And Babulal showed that you can define a strong inclusion using a new alpha. Precisely the strong inclusion is defined this way. So this is the strong inclusion induced by an n star. So A rather below B, and for each thing in alpha, either A, the star of A is in n u alpha or B is in n u alpha. And this is a strong inclusion. So it determines a compactification by Banaszewski's result. What the, com the compactification determined by such a strong inclusion is what Bubble Hour called an N star compactification. By the way, the least compactification would be a one star compactification. So it is, uh, it is in this class of compactifications, the least compactification matrices. And this was done, as I said, by Barbulal in this paper, 2014 paper. And years later, I studied perfectness of such compactification after realizing that they are not always perfect. And then my thing was, when are they perfect? But then I fixed myself to the case where n is equal to 2 and uh, realized that you can actually do what I did for n equals to 2. You can do it for any positive n. So, yeah, if you consider now the set of all compactification ordered the way I defined the ordering earlier on, this would be a whole set, a partially ordered set. If you give me an, a positive integer, I'm going to denote L by Ln of L, the set of all n star compactifications of a regular continuous frame. I'm saying regular continuous frame because n star compactifications exist precisely for this class of frames. True story. Now, this thing over here, this collection of all the n stars, if you collect all the n stars, the Frudenthal compactification is going to be the upper bound of all such compactifications, but not only that, it's going to be the least upper bound of all such compactifications. And the proof, uh, make, make no mistake, I didn't include the proof because uh, it, it's a bit, a bit technic technical, but it's a nice proof once you understand it. Yeah. Now, uh, we spoke about reflections, and I said that we will decide la later whether reflections means reflecting on the top or reflections in a categorical sense. So yeah, reflections that I was talking about were the categorical reflections. So let me let me just define some uh, make my life easy here. I'm going to say that an element in L is a pi element if that is compact. Okay, if you have a frame homomorphism from L to M, you will call that frame homomorphism an F-map if it satisfies this condition right here. Whenever you take two elements, which are pi elements joining at the top, then you can find in your core domain other pi elements satisfying this, also joining at the top. That is what you would call an F-map. By the way, not every frame homomorphism is an F-map. However, if one takes the, the take the Frudenthal, for example, Frudenthal compactification, uh, you look at the join, that will become 
and F map. Now, so happens that if you look at the category of compact regular frames and F map, by the way, F maps in the category of compact regular frames are precisely all the, the frame homomorphisms. So you have a full subcategory there. Uh, not only is it full, but it is core reflective in the category of really compact frames, where the core reflection is witnessed by precisely what I mentioned, the, the join map going from the fluid tower to your really compact frame. And that is where I want to end my talk. This is the end. And by the way, this is a joke. If you remember, in my introduction, I said Fluentel used the notion of ends to define this compactification. So this is the end of Fluentel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Simo. Uh, any questions from the attendees or comments? I maybe have one, if I can. Yes, uh, ma'am. Go ahead. First of all, Sim, I want to congratulate you with uh, the very nice talk. It's impressive results. You keep, so congratulations. And the talk also was very nice. Just a, 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 a question. Um, you're talking about these uh, continuous frames and, and things like that. They are spatial if you have enough choice, isn't it? Yeah. Um, do your methods work constructively or just a, a question? Or some of them or? Precisely everything, everything done here is constructively. Precisely. Everything done is constructive. Yes. Wow. Even the way the way the the, the fruit and tall compactification is defined, <laughs> Babula did it in a very purely constructive, no assumption of any choice principle. And you didn't use any um um how do you call it uh, contraposition or proof by contraposition or anything? No. Wow. So I, re I I strengthen my congratulations even then. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, 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 Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark. Any other questions or comments for Simo? By the way, that was a good question, Mark, because in spaces, when one constructs the Fluentile compactification, you you need the Boolean ultrafilter theorem, which is, yeah. you, you know, as you know, it's a, it's a choice. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I hope the absence of questions means Simo was preaching to the choir, or <laughs> he just... <laughs> <laughs> or you just confused the audience and uh, <laughs> but anyway if you would like to catch up on um the talk it will be uploaded on the netx website and also on our youtube channel mm. and um you can also find dr mteto's details in case you have uh, follow-up questions um so in with that said, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Simo, for taking time to give this talk.